Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let us start. Uh, I'm a pretty boring person, and some of you may have seen me before because I was here like in two years in a row. Uh, so if you need any information about me, then you got a link, but I'm a boring person, so we will not uh, talk about that. Uh, I work for a company which is uh, just a normal internet shop. There are plenty of them. Uh, this one is nothing special. It's got 10,000 servers. 600 engineers, 550, more than 550 uh, microservices, uh, a nice, nice traffic, I would say, uh, a lot of Java. So just a typical small internet shop uh, in Europe. Um, and the interesting part here is this gentleman. This gentleman, unfortunately, is dead, uh, and he died last year. And uh, if you don't know who he is, then let me say just that he wrote a lot of good things, both in the software and uh, about software. And one thing you should definitely read is uh, his protocol of dying, because he was dying of cancer. And as an engineer, he wrote exactly how to die. And this might be interesting to you, because you're all going to die. So I really suggest you read this. But apart from, from that, he also uh, wrote, uh, he is the founder of ZeroMQ and a guy who wrote uh, uh, ne necromancy of the software systems or something like that. And, and it, if you look at those things, then you realize he's a really a full stack developer. And by full stack here, I mean the guy who actually understands the bits and the, and the uh, mechanical t sympathy right underneath. So he's a, he, he was a smart guy until he died, and he wrote. At, uh, at, in the documentation for ZeroMQ, he actually wrote something like this. The physics of software is not algorithms, data structures, languages, and abstractions. These are just tools we make use, throw away. The real physics of software is the physics of people, speci specifically our limitation when it comes to complexity, and our desire to work together to solve large problems in pieces, right? So the science of programming is actually to make building blocks that people can understand and use easily. And this is, about, this is what this talk is going to be about. So what kind of building blocks do we have? And I'm using Java, so the samples will be in Java. Uh, for the large-scale building blocks, we already have quite a few. Um, in the Java world, we have uh, modules like Maven, Gradle modules. We have jars. Uh, since this year, we actually have Java 9, so we can use the Java 9 modules, although it remains to be seen how well the modul modularity of Java is going to be used, and it depends a lot on tooling. Then we have the microservices, which everyone is using, even my small internet shop in Poland. Uh, so we already, everybody knows what to do with large blocks, right? Large building blocks. With sm on small scale, it's also very simple, because every university teaches about that. You got private methods, you got encapsulation, you got nested classes, this kind of things, right? It's very simple, but this is below a few hundred uh, lines, as long as you write good code. Now, on the medium scale, because between those two, here is a problem. I teach a lot. I actually uh, run a lot of workshops, apart from, from a full-time uh, job. So I, I notice how people actually uh, uh, what people actually do on this scale. And on this scale, there are horrors. Maybe Java 9 modules will solve the problem, but to be honest, I don't think so, because actually we already have a, a solution for that that nobody uses. And that solution is package scope composition. And for some of you, it might be obvious or it might be just naive, but let me show you how do people use actually package scope and why it is important. It is important because we want to have building blocks also in the middle ground, somewhere between thousands of lines and hundreds of lines. So if you look at this, and I'm not sure whether you can actually, but this is the Java util package. And if you look at this, and this is from IntelliJ IDEA, so you get the, uh, uh, this small log here that tells you when a class is, uh, is public. Okay? And if you look at this, you see that most of those classes are public. But this is a sample from, of course, a toolkit, right? This is Java Util. This is to be used by all the other programmers. So everything here should be public, even, it, even though it isn't, right? And if you're writing tools, that's the default thing you do, right? Now let's have a look at the same package, but uh, actually about collections, but from Google. And here you will notice that actually most of those classes are package scope. So they actually do not let you touch them. They don't let you use them, right? Why would they do this? Now, these are, these are tools. 
How do actually normal people uh, use package scope, and what do they do between a few hundred and a few thousand lines? Uh, well, uh, of course, the uh, um, source of all the knowledge in programming is in Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, right? So the, uh, the, the question that I've looked for there was, uh, is the Java package scope actually any useful at all? And then the answer that got accepted, this is the first accepted answer, is that, uh, well, uh, of course you can use it, but other than the aspects of design purity, you could just make everything public and be OK with that. And it seems that this is exactly what people think about the package scope and about, you know, between the 2,000 and the 200. And how is that possible? Well, if you look at a sample, and this is another sample, this is an application, this is a version from 2016, and this is an application that actually teaches you or shows you the basics of the most popular Java framework, which is Spring. And you see something like this. There are, on top level, there are four packages, or maybe five. Model, repository, service, util, web, right? Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you have such layered architecture, everything has got to be public. Why? Because, because all those classes has got, have got to talk with each other from, with things from different uh, packages, right? Why do we do that? Can, raise your hand if you did something like this before, right? Yeah, exactly. We all did that, right? So why did we do it? It makes no sense. Code is for us to be read, right? And we just made a story that is something like that. Here you've got characters, vehicles, relationships, plots, and conclusions. Is this an interesting book? Is it really easy to read? Not really. It's actually harder to read than anything else. But this was an example from the authors of the framework, right? Maybe they wanted to show us that well, these are the different building blocks that you can use inside the framework, and it makes sense from, from their perspective, because they are not focused on any particular domain, just on the tools that they are providing. So they got another example here, and this example, uh, this example is an older application, and Greenhouse from 2012, and you can actually see that the packages here are completely different. No more model. So what's the logic behind this? And I ask the question, what's the logic behind this on every single conference that I talk about, talk on, right? And nobody knows. The, the best answer I've seen was, it's hard to say. So yeah, yeah sure, it's hard to say. But you can, you can see that some of those packages maybe are about a function of the software. And maybe this time, we, we might be able to not use the public for every single class. And it's actually not that case, not, not such a case. Every single class here is public as well, because, well, this is what we, this is what we base on when we you know, are learning, right? These are the examples, how to do a good application. So <clears throat> another example to show how, uh, how bad the situation is, is that the, the research that was done on 3 million GitHub repos about uh, the most common words per language and technology, right? And what do you think? What is more common in Java, public or private? The package scope is kind of tricky because there is no, common, no, no tri uh, keyword in Java for that, right? But what should be more, more um, popular in Java? Public, private. There is this thing called encapsulation, right? And encapsulation says, hide everything you can. And if you can hide everything you can, then the private should be more popular. But actually, that's not the case. The third most popular word in Java, in Java classes, actually, are, are, is public. And private is on the 17th place. And if I were to bet my money on where the package scope is, I would say that it's far, far behind that. Okay? But of course, we cannot check it because there is no special word for it. So how do other languages actually solve that problem about blocks that are between a few hundred and a few thousand or several thousand lines of code. Now, Kotlin is a pretty nice language, uh, which uh, get, uh, gets popularity right now, right? So what happens there? First of all, they have changed the default. The default right now is public, right? If you don't do anything, the class is automatically public. Then you have the private, then you have the protected, which is, works the same as in Java. And then you have a special keyword called internal. 
Now, this means that this single class or method is not completely public, but actually can be used only in the same Maven Gradle on Ant project, right? Or just basically, these are like modules from Java, perhaps? But from this information, I can tell you exactly how the, the guys uh, uh, that actually wrote this language, how, they do, how do they work? They have a lot of little, little building uh, blocks, uh, but either I think they use actually Maven for that. Then you can see, uh, uh, look at uh, an older language, which is Groovy. And then what you see is this. Once again, public is the default. There are no, no special keyword for that. And then you got private protected, and then you have package scope. But it looks kind of different. It actually is an annotation, not a keyword. How is that possible? Well, they've added that in a version, I think, 1.8, where they, they found out, and Groovy has got this idea that it should be completely uh, uh, to be, it should be able to, you should be able to use it instead of Java whenever you want, and it should behave more or less the same. And when they found that some uh, uh, frameworks or some uh, tools actually required the package scope, which is kind of strange. Why would you require a package scope, a class to be packaged? Okay, fair enough. How about Scala? Scala, of course, as always, is much better language than anything else. So what we have is public, which is the default. And then we have protected and private. But this time, we can actually mark whether this, uh, this class is protected or private in a, in a package. And we can name the package there, or several, several packages, or a class, for example. So we, we can name exactly what are, the, what are the bits of the building block that we are building. OK. so. That, all that knowledge seems to be lost because all the new languages actually use the public as a default, and only Java actually allows you to do anything more. Uh, so maybe we should be OK with that and just forget about it and have spaghetti there. And I would like to actually uh, uh, show to you that it's much better when you have some kind of an encapsulation and building blocks. It's much easier to clean it later on. So what would happen if the package scope was our default in Java. Have a look at this package. And this is from a production code uh, a few months or maybe a year ago. And you can see right, right now that there is just one single class with this padlock open, right? So what does it mean? Well, it means that this thing is public. Are there any benefits for that? Well, we, we see exactly where it starts, right? If you enter this package and you, and you look at it, and then you know exactly that there is one class which is designed for you to touch. This is the interface. This is what you should talk with. And everything else should not be important, unless you actually want to go into the gory details, right? But as long as you're interested in the behavior, that's the point of interest, right? Uh, so there are uh, good advantages, advantages for that. It makes it clearer where the enter point is. There is less to put in your head. It's easier to test, because you can only test the public endpoint, for example. And uh, it's easier to refactor, because if I have tests only for the public part, so I'm testing only the behavior, then I can change everything inside. And I don't have to change my tests at all. Then it's a simple block with simple, simple API. It's a simple block, one class, and that's the API. That's it. If you have several like these, then it's much easier to actually re to reason about the whole system, because you only have to memorize and think about the, the, the public classes out there, right? And this is a default in Java. Perhaps the authors of the language actually thought that you, what you're going to do is you're going to write every single class as a package scope, and then you're going to maybe add some other words later on when you need them, right? And this knowledge seems to be completely lost. And when you go into the uh, Stack Overflow this time, to, uh, and I, I searched for a quest good question there, and there was a question that, what is, the, what is the general difference in Java between default, public, protected, and private? Then the second most popular answer, not the first, the first one was actually much better, but the second most popular answer comes from a pair programmer who, un who answers that, well, he, he's got a good explanation because he's a Perl programmer, not because he's a Java programmer. So he understands how it works in the wilderness, in other languages, in the whole world, right? And then he explains that there are actually four different, way, uh, um, four different uh, visibility modifiers in Java. And then he talks about published. And he says, well, 
published means it's outside of your control. And it's not in the Java syntax, which is a problem, but we'll talk about it later, right? But Java just lacks this simple word published, which would make it out of your control. And then he t talks about the different stuff, and then he ends with this. I, uh, pr privately, he just sticks with private and public. Well, because uh, protected is kind of, kind of like a cheat, and package scope, he doesn't even mention that. But the idea of published is very important, because published means that this is the API, this is something others can use, you, this is your contract, you cannot break it, right? Or something in the system might break. <sighs> so I don't know, what I, my, my knowledge of English is very limited, so I'm not sure what's the difference between public and published, but I suppose that in this situation, it means exactly the same. Whenever you make something public, it's no longer yours. It's public, right? Everybody can touch that. So if other parts of the system use that, then if you change it, it breaks. Simple. Now, to show you, actually, that it is much more natural in Java, for example, to use this kind of reasoning, I'll show you how, how I write software. And this is another example from production. Let, I, need, I need to write some software, and I have requirements, which is the, clients, the, the stuff that has to happen in the system and the stuff that has to happen in the UI, because we have to show something, and we usually have to show the whole database. And in here, the most simple thing you can do is actually look something like this, where you have, where you, while you are using Spring or any MVC framework, you just have a uh, user asking for something, like creating an article, and then the controller talking with the facade, which is an entry point to the rest of the system, which call, talk, talks to the factory, which creates the, the class, and then with the repository, because we need to save it, right? Now, the question is, for those of you who actually know Java, which of those classes have to be public? And I've asked that question even when there, there, there were guys from Pivotal on the, on the, uh, uh, in the room, right? And the answer, the correct answer is none, but n nobody gave me that, question, uh, that answer. It works very well without any public classes, right? So the next question is, which should be public? Any ideas? Some of the people would say, OK, I need controller to be public. And I say, why? Well, because somebody else, else uh, is using it. But are you actually writing this somebody else? No, actually, Spring uses that. So does Spring care whether you, it's public or package scope? Spring doesn't care. Okay. So the thing that should be public, most likely, is the facade, which is the entry point to my module. Why should it be public? Well, because this is the. API that I want to give to the rest of the system. If anybody needs to create, for example, an article, he can call that facade, OK? And that's it. And of course, because we are in Java, I also have to make pub, uh, the DTOs public, right? I cannot, ha uh, I cannot have structures at this point yet in Java, so I have to uh, those classes which are also public. So this brings us to the situation when there is the, the, uh, the, the package looks like this. And yeah. Now you see, now, up there, at, uh, in, in the beginning, we started with actually putting the controllers, which we called endpoints for some funny reason, uh, on the top level. Then we, hide the, uh, then we would actually move and hide them inside, because you don't want to look at them at all, because you don't use them. You actually talk with the uh, application through HTTP, or you actually talk with the, with the domain part, which has got the facade. And that's pretty much it. And we got a lot of classes, and the DTO and exceptions, because the exceptions are actually a little bit like the DTOs, because they move into the, being the public part. Now, for the UI, we quite often have got to actually take all the data from the database and show some, somehow, right? So what do we do with that? Well, the easiest way, actually, to still have a module that doesn't have anything public in there, except for the facade, is to create another part which would base uh, on the CQRS uh, pattern which is command query responsibility segregation. What it means is that if you want to change something in the world, you go this way, and this is the, the whole facade and the domain, the database. But if you want to get some data out, you actually go this way, which is as fast as you can using another facade, for example, and just reaching through the data as fast as possible. And with uh, patterns like this, the CQRS, it sometimes 
uh, uh, looks like, okay, this might be difficult. And actually, event sourcing, shouldn't, be, shouldn't it be used with event sourcing, for example? I would like to show you how easy it is actually to use in Java. I use MongoDB as my database there. So my article is a document where I point to the Mongo collection. This is just a string so that Mongo knows how I want to name it, even though I, later on I will refactor this, for example, to another name. And then when I want to take the data out, I actually create another class which is based on the same collection, but this time I put only the data that I want out to be there, for example. And this time, what I have is two different APIs. I have a facade that you can work with and you can do something on the module, and then I have some data that you can take out in a fast, much faster way, but it's completely separate. So if I, if I need to change anything inside and refactor, I'm free to do so. Uh, so the article actually has got the query part, which returns the, which, where you, you can talk with the repository directly there, and you just send some search params and you got the DTO, and that's it. Now, if you're not using MongoDB, but you're using, for example, uh, uh, JPA, there is a language called JPQL where you can select data directly from a database into an object, and you don't have to go with the JPA, for example. So it's easy as that. You just create the kind of data structures that you want. You make them public, but these are different data structures than the one that actually make all the logic of, the, of your business. And the next package you do, you do exactly the same thing, or maybe you do something completely different, because if each package has got a clear API, why the uh, architecture of each package has got to be the same? It doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? So this one actually looks the same. And then you got infrastructure, because it's all cool, and the uh, secure S is nice, and you got the hexagonal architecture, which we'll talk about later on. But then you got the infrastructure. And how does the loot infrastructure look, look like? Well, if, you're, if you read the domain-driven design by Eric Evans, then you know that there is the, you should actually not depend in your domain code to the infrastructure. It should be the other way around. So what you do is you create a public interface where you have no implementation for it. And then the infrastructure looks like this. And just in case it's not visible, there is not a single, pack, single public class there. Why? Well, because you should not touch a single pub class from there. What should happen is the, is the container, in this case uh, Spring, should actually find out the implementation and give you the implementation of the interface. That's it. Not a single class, not the single public class was given. Same thing with the configuration, for example, classes. But this leads me to another problem where all the developers that I know of, uh, when they start with uh, 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 dependency injection co containers like Spring, what they do is put everything there. From now on, every single class should be inside, OK? And the question is why? And there is no answer. It's, again, again uh, it's something that people just don't think about. They just put it there, and it looks like this car, right? But the way it was actually designed is that you would think about what should be public, and you would put to, the, uh, 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 to, to this container only the things that you want to be published so that it stays there and anybody else can use it. And here's how to do it. It's as simple as that. You can create new classes by giving it new, right? And you got them. But here you see that I also have some classes given there, injected there through the, uh, through the parameters of this method. Why? Well, the reason for that is because those classes are either another module, something else, another building block that I want to work with this one, or they are talking with the I.O. And why would I uh, be interested in the I.O. part? Well, there is, a, there is a reason for that. And the reason is because I'm doing test-driven development. And test-driven development is very difficult if you have to, to do integration tests only. So what I want to do is I want to be as fast as possible and just change the implementation for the infrastructure part there. And the infrastructure part is actually what implements the I.O., right? Whenever I go to the I.O., my unit test dies because it gets much slower. So this comes from the research uh, by Jakob Nielsen, where he pointed out how important it is to actually have your application in, in, in the middle, because this is called uh, hexagonal architecture, when your application is in the middle or the uh, logic of your module, and everything else, like all the infrastructure, is actually given later on. Jakob Nielsen showed in 1993 that if something takes less than a second, then human beings do not break the flow of thought, which means that whatever you're doing, you're still doing it, 
right? One second is cool. Then, if something you do it takes uh, uh, 10 seconds, uh, or longer, longer than 10 seconds, then it loses your attention, which means that if I run a test and it runs under one second, I don't know, do not notice. If it runs over 10 seconds, I'm on Twitter or on Facebook or somewhere else, but I basically I lost interest in actually doing this anymore. And then there is another interesting topic, which, is, uh, which was researched, in, I think it was Saber in 2010, in, uh, the, I, I saw the presentation in Krakow at that time, when they, when they pointed out that if unit tests, all your unit tests that you're running, take more than 30 seconds, people stop running them. People will actually run them when they run integration tests. And when, how long do, they t t do those integration tests t take? Well, they found out that if they take more than three minutes okay, on your machine, you will stop running them. Most developers, if all the tests, integration tests and unit tests, take more than three minutes, actually would either push to the re uh, repository and to the server and wait for the con uh, continuous integration server to tell them that something broke, or just don't give a shit. So that's a problem. That's a big problem for me, because whenever I have a clear new... I have an old laptop here, right? It's got more than two years right now. But if I, if I, if I run an empty uh, application from Spring, I just generate start Spring I.O. and I generate an empty application, and I run integration tests on it, then the, the container in Spring starts, and it takes seven second, seconds for it to start, which is a lot of time. Now, if I have a real application where I have to actually have a memory, in memory database like Fongo or H2, then it takes 22 seconds, and I've measured it against this, the, the, the stuff that I actually code on, right? So it means that if I wanted to know if my test or my code works, I would be on Facebook twice, at least, right? You cannot do test-driven development this, this, way, this way, right? I do, I do a lot of workshops, and I coach test-driven and behavior-driven development. And what happens is that I quite often see that people tried to do test-driven development, and they decided that it was too slow, they, they failed, they don't want it, they don't like it. And when I investigate what are the real reasons are the need, most of the time, or all of the time, is that they had to wait for the outcomes. And I'm like, how is that even possible? My, my, my unit tests are like milliseconds, right? I got, three more, I got about 300 uh, unit tests for this microservice, and it, it takes less than, two, less than three seconds altogether, right? And if I had to actually do it this, the way they do it, so like ten, wait 10 minutes for a test to finish, no, I wouldn't be able to do test-driven development at all. I wouldn't be able to do it even if I had to wait a few seconds, okay? So that's why it is really important to have this configuration, uh, this uh, um, infrastructure path out, right? And another example to show you that this is very natural and very easy is when you're writing a new system. Because I think we kind of lost the knowledge about, how to, about software engineering. How do we do when we have new requirements and a new system to create? What would be the first step? The first step would actually be to actually gather the requirements, right? We need to know what we are building. But what would be the, what would be the second step? We got this. This is written down in some kind of a business language, for example, right? Then we need to actually analyze this and think about, OK, so what do we need to do? Or what do we need to get done? Or in other words, what is the, what, what is the scenario? And this is a behavioral specification and, specific, uh, and scenario for a system, a very simple system. But basically, you take the in business English and you turn it into something that makes sense, that is precise, on examples, for example, right? Then the next step would be to turn this into an acceptance uh, um, specification, which is uh, basically acceptance tests, right? And we do that. And at this point, everything breaks. Because what is the next step that we should do? We already know what the system should do. We might be even able to write later on a test for that, or even now. What should we do now? And usually what people say when I ask them that on, during my workshops, they, they tell me, yeah, let's design the database. Or another approach, yeah, let's write to controllers or send something over HTTP, write the test there. And I'm like, OK, so you already want to know to sit, to sit there and code, right? Because you're bored with this. This is not, not real code. 
But the thing that we should do, and I remember this from the university 15 years ago, is that we should actually do some architecture, right? We should do some thinking. Why? But, well, because one week of programming can save 15 minutes of planning, right? So ex actually, the, the 15 minutes of, of thinking about the architecture makes sense. And then people have actually a problem, because when, then, whenever I ask them about the architecture, they go back to the database. But you're not writing database, you're, you're a Java developer or a C-sharp developer, you're writing your code, right? So what are the building blocks there? Because in the simplest possible form, the architecture, as the Robert C. Martin actually said, the, 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 I, I, I like this description of architecture, a, 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 a bunch of boxes with arrows pointing into, into one direction, right? Very, very important, because if you don't have them pointing in one direction, you have cycles, and computers do not like cycles. OK, so for this, you may think for a while and come up with modules based on the requirements what would you have to, to have it split into different blocks? And then comes, there you have the blocks, right? And when you have the blocks, you can actually use your mad graphical skills to design something. And Simon Brown would kill me for that, because actually I was on his workshop, so I know it's, it's completely wrong, and there are no errors there. But it doesn't matter, because it's good enough. Because right now, what I know is that I'm going to have different blocks that are going to talk with each other. Okay? And I know they will be okay, more or less, because they do not talk with each other too much. If they had to talk with each other too much, they would probably be a single block. So I got some idea for an architecture. It's not a good architecture, but still, I still have something, right? Now let's code it. And what we do right now is this. We start with a unit test. Why would I start with a unit test, not, an, uh, uh, not a difficult, no, no, not a test with uh, HTTP, for example? Well, because 50% of my time whenever I develop a software is the infrastructure part, right? And the infrastructure part is simple in that I know exactly how it, I want it to behave, but it's just hard to write, as you're going to see. But this, this time, I need first to validate whether this idea was good, okay? So I want this architecture to, to uh, I want the test to verify whether this is, this is the direction that we should go to, right? So what do I do? I need make, a, this is using Spock library for testing. First of all, I need something to talk with. So if I'm in developing, for example, a module called Films, then I'm going to create something called Film Facade, because this is the entry point, right? And I know this, is, this creates the whole module, so I cannot just uh, call a constructor on, on Film Facade, because I know it's going to be more complex. And if you have something complex, then you should have, you should have another, classes, another class that does it. You shouldn't put it into a constructor. So I'm going to create a theme configuration, although the, actually the pattern is called creator, not configuration. But let's call it theme configuration. Then I'm going to create some sample data. This time I'm going to create two DTOs, and I know at this point that I have some DTOs and how do they look. Then I create the test, a very simple test. When I learn that on the facade, if I want to show something, I need to add something first. So that gives me two methods on my facade, right? And then when I want to show a whole list of things, then I learn that I cannot actually, I have to add again and, and return something. But maybe taking all the data from the database is not good, so I will return a page. Simple stuff. And somewhere at this point, I have that. Through the test-driven development, I have film, film creator, film type, configuration, film facade, and I need to be able to save it somewhere. To get through adding to actually getting something, I need to save it somewhere, right? So why not in memory? I could add a database there, but it's actually quite complex. So why not the memory? This is a very difficult uh, implementation of the of the repository, something that keeps data in the memory. And it's based on a single class, map. Okay? Actually, map is the interface. Because I'm fancy, I like the concurrent hash map. Other people would just use the normal hash map and have exactly the same outcomes. But this is the implementation of the database. And uh, with this test, I can confirm that my logic and everything else works well in milliseconds. And how many milliseconds, actually? Well, between 0 and 1, most of the time if the J, uh, J unit is running uh, fast enough. Then I have to add the I.O. Because now I have, I have actually validated whether this was a good idea. OK, I, I have the code. I have the implementation. It looks good. OK, all the classes, this is fine. So let's actually move. 
And let's add the I.O. And I told you this is hard. So this is how you add the I.O. The first one is the controller from Spring, just to add the talking with the, through the HTTP. The second one is the implementation, or actually the interface, of the uh, database access, because it's so boring that Spring can do it automatically. And then another thing, if we want to test, right now I would like to test it through the uh, acceptance spec, which uses the whole thing, talks with the database, uses Mongo, Fongo, whatever I, the hell I'm using. And I take the class that I have created uh, earlier, the film configuration, and I add two annotations. I add annotation configuration and an annotation bean. And voila, it works, right? But here I have to do th two things. For the unit test part, I'm going to call this method. For the uh, production version, I'm going to call this method. OK? And because this method actually calls the same method, I will not have a mismatch of configuration. The thing that can break, though, of course, is the version implementation of the repository or access to the database, which is why I have an acceptance spec at the end. Or maybe I have it uh, earlier, but I have already t tested my whole building block. OK? So it's easy as that. And a, a friend of mine, ah, so some people at this point say, OK, but you know what? You have this in your production code, and it's only being called th uh, through tests or by tests, right? So you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't have code that is only called through tests. So then I do this. And I told them, OK, this is a profile. I want to have my application running in memory so I don't have to set up a database on my laptop. And I'm going to call this profile a timer. A friend of mine actually came up with this idea because it's going to forget everything once you restart it. And then they are fine. They say, OK, now you're using this in production, or actually on the developer's machine, but it's fine. So another interesting thing, so this is a very natural thing to have a single public class, because this is the only class that is the API for your module, and this is what you test. Everything else is an add-on, or everything else is hidden underneath. And when it's hidden underneath, you can refactor all the way you want. And I don't have to change any single line of my test code, right? But there are important lessons there as well. For example, mocking and stabbing. And we have a beautiful presentation about tests before, so I'm not going to repeat a lot. But basically, we kind of overuse mocking, mocks, and stabs, right? And the best example is when you have a class and you give, give, it, give to the class all the mocks, everything it needs, you give mocks and stabs. And then you test the class. And the question is, what are you actually testing? What does it give you? Does it repeat the same implementation that you had inside the class? It makes no sense. So what happens here is that if you give the I.O. to the developer, so for example, if I had this method like this, and I would give the developer article repository, art reader client, which is another system, article archive, which is another repository, then what happens is that when a new developer starts writing tests, tests then what he does is this. He calls, OK, article configuration, give me the whole module, give me the facade. Okay? And then he says, OK, it needs an article repository. So I'm going to create an article repository, which is I have already prepared in the, in the production code in memory version. right? So I'm going to give it there. But what happens next is horrifying. When you do something like that in your tests, the developer will actually do check on a database after adding an article, whether the article is there. Okay? And why is it wrong? Because what if we changed the whole thing and it now works my magic? Okay? I keep it in something quantum, whatever. I don't know. But I don't have the database anymore. Of course, the code is broken, right? No. If it returns, if your module still works and survives or restarts, then probably it's all OK. right? So, if you give them a chance to actually talk with the I.O. or something internal for the module, they will use that to verify the state of the module, which is what I don't want. I actually want them to only verify the behavior, which, by the way, is the definition of behavior-driven development. And to, uh, to be able to verify only the behavior, the only thing they can talk with is the facade. And the only thing they can inject are other modules. Okay? And that happens uh, a lot. For, for me, for this example, I, and I had this on production, and I had those developers actually using the, the database, so everything I'm talking about right now is, is my own experience. And I had two different modules there. And if I pass those modules, then it's OK, because the only, these are the only mocks in my system. 
If you're testing a single module, then you can pass mocks there to, to, uh, to mock other modules. And that's it, because these are other building blocks. Simple. Now, to be even better at this, and it's not that hard to be even better at this, you can go even further and actually use events. And events are a very simple thing. Like, if I don't want my building blocks to know about each other, the only thing I need to have there is some kind of an event bus, right? And if I post an event and talk about the things that have happened in the system, then other parts of the system, which are other building blocks, will use that. And I will have no need for a mock or a stop whatsoever. Actually, I will need a mock or stop because I'll still need to actually stop external services. Because my microservice, and we have 550 of them, talks with other, other code. So yeah, I, I, I still have to use like wire mock, and I still use mocking for uh, modules. Um, we were thinking about whether it would be better to actually test the whole microservice and all its building blocks all together inside the unit test, because you can, you can create them the same way, just talking with the uh, configuration and then getting the facade of everything. But we decided we don't want to do that. We want to test each single module in a unit test apart from all the other modules. Why would we do that? Well, because we quite often take this when those modules grow inside your microservice, you take them out. This is the top level package. You take them out and create a new microservice there. And it's simple as that. And it doesn't take a lot of time. OK? We actually do that. And if you think about events, then as long as you're using Spring, to have uh, in, inside a single instance, to have an event bus, you don't need to do anything. You already have it there, because from Spring has it implemented inside. So you need one, actually you need, I think, two annotations. And those annotations, one of the method that will receive the event, and then you need to inject the, uh, the class that is uh, uh, event emitter or something like that. Uh, and then, you, then, then you're done. And all your modules do not need to talk with each other anymore directly, for example, and you have more freedom. That's pretty much it. So uh, the next step, actually, is to realize that the reason why we had so much problems with monolithic applications is not because they were monoliths. It's not because it were just a single build. The single build is painful because it takes a lot of time, but the main problem was that everything inside a single application was public. Why? My IDE actually creates all the classes public by default and all the methods public by default. And people don't change that too much. So when everything is public, after two years, or maybe even a year, but usually after two years, you get a lot of spaghetti code. Why? Because a developer could use some class, so he decided that he will use this class. As long as it's package scope and you have clear APIs, then you point to the developer that maybe you shouldn't do it, OK? And you should actually use only the, uh, the building blocks and talk with each other. And if it's difficult, if it, it looks like, OK, this feature doesn't belong anywhere, it doesn't fit the, uh, the architecture there, then maybe we should right now refactor the architecture and change it. That's it. So my summary for this, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, on, I'm on time, fortunately, is that you can have, you should create building blocks. It's like. Uh, it's like, uh, what, what is it called, babushka? It's better when we have systems that are composed of simple building blocks on high level and every single level you look underneath. And how many building blocks can you put inside your hand, head? It's actually proven that most people actually can, uh, can uh, put into their working memory, which is like the processor cache, uh, seven plus minus minus three objects, right? And that's pretty much it. So this is how many things you should have. If you have more, then maybe make it another babushka level or something like that. Uh, and if you do that, it's very easy to actually use the system. And you can build monolithic applications, even though, though I don't do it anymore, uh, uh, just with using modules. And packages are your modules. They are there by default. By default, you do not have a single public keyword there unless you actually use the IDE. So I treat, I, I, we've, we've started to treat the public keyword as the published interface, and everything has changed for us. Um, we, I also suggest removing all the public keywords from the, your IDE. It helps a lot when you have to add it. 
when you don't have it by default. You actually won't be able to do that in IntelliJ IDEA for like methods, I think, but you will be able to do it for classes, and that's good enough. And then uh, if, you, if you build it like that, then your, tests, your testing experience will be very good. It will be easy to test because you will know exactly what you can test, and it will be very bloody fast to actually test it because this will take only milliseconds. Okay? And then you have the tests that actually test everything inside the module, all the logic, before you actually start writing the integration tests. And then you go to the integration tests, and it turns out you don't need to have so many of them because now everything you need to do is verify whether the positive checks, positive flow, for example, works, or what happens if the database has nothing, or, or maybe not even that, but what happens if the database crashes. I have tests like that, for example, in the integration tests, where all the logic and all the corner cases are unit tested just because it's so bloody fast and easy. And it's actually simpler than not doing it. Same with the SecureRS. The thing that the, the reason why we don't do it is because of the, of course, IDE and because of the lack of uh, thinking about simple building blocks somewhere in the middle. That's th that's everything. Thank you. Whoa. Thank you. Amazing. So we have uh, we have a few questions here. So first question, Jakub, yeah, ready? So if facades only use other facades, how do you solve cross-references? For example, a single repository used in multiple places. Because breaking into smaller uh, facades looks like a bloat. So, so cross-references, you mean uh, 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 cycles? Yep. Yeah. First of all, if you have a cycle, something's wrong with your code, in, in, in Java at least. Why? Well, because the, the, the structure of the code of the, an object-oriented language is a tree. You start with a single object, which has other single objects, or objects, or lists of objects, and, and so on, so on. The moment when you have a cycle, you're going to have bad experience. Garbage collector is not going to work. It's an, it won't be able to clean it. The, if you're using JPA, Hibernate, for example, in JPA, this is a classic example of an error, where you have a cycle, a cycle, a cycle dependency there. But quite often inside our code, we need to do something that looks like we need cycle references. How does it look like? Well. It means that one code, and I'm, I'm going to find the slide in a second, uh, then one piece of code actually needs to do something and would like to have some data from another piece. Oh, right there, right? And would like, I, I would like to, for example, create, a, I don't know, a, a, uh, an, an author of an article, a, a new author, but I need to find whether I don't have authors like that already, or maybe I need to search whether there are articles that are supposed to be for that out, whatever else. And it turns out that this problem usually disappears the moment you do this, CQRS. Because now you have two modules, the one module which actually does the work, and some other module which actually talks with you, right, about the stuff that they get, they have. But you should be very careful every time you have such a problem. If you have two modules and you have to draw them in this, uh, this very bad uh, diagram that I had, which has got no arrows, then you would have arrows that actually point in each other direction. From the definition by Robert C. Martin, this is not an architecture anymore. And maybe you should think about how to change it to be an architecture. And that's it. And, uh, Quite often, I see a situation when we think we have that, that we need to have the cyclic dependency, and never, ever have we ended up with a cycling de cyclic dependency. We all, always found out that, OK, our assumptions and architecture was wrong, and we had to refactor it, and we never had that problem again with this part of code. That's it. Thank you. OK, uh, what uh, would you do in Python where everything is public? Where? In Python. Everything is public there. There are no scopes. I don't know. <laughs> OK, <laughs> good. I, uh, the, the idea is not about public or not public. The idea is about building blocks, right? If I can somehow show that I have those building blocks, and it's easy for you to comprehend and for you to understand, then it's OK. I, would, I could live with all the classes public as long as I have some other mechanism for showing the modules and, and something in between. And Java 9 modules, for example, are a solution to that, although I'm not quite sure we will use them the way they are designed, or we will not use them for this problem most likely. 
Great, thank you. How you name or uh, can you name or give pointers to projects with the best package structure? Ha, oh, that's a very good one. So I have that, this project on this, this laptop. I have quite a few of them because I wrote them, right? But unfortunately, most of them, yeah, like every developer, the, the project that you write is the best. Of course. Well, if I knew that it was wrong, I wouldn't write it, right? I would refactor it if I was allowed to, of course, because there are business requirements and so on. But back, back to, uh, to examples. Right now, I do not ha I have actually a very simple, uh, very simple um, uh, repository, where, which I use for workshops. But it's not a good one because to be able to uh, to understand all the complexity that comes from it, these are very simple examples. I need to show you the production code, and unfortunately, I'm not uh, 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 allowed yet to show you the production code in full. I was able to show you some slides there, but not the whole uh, project. Now I'm working on it. Okay, I'm working on it to actually make it public, and just because I think that it would also work for my company at least to make every single microservice, which is not essential because it's for, for some other reason, to make it public and, and ha have it for you to actually diagnose or see. You could also have a, a nice hacks there, I suppose, after all. OK, uh, thank you, Jakob. We kind of run out of time for, for questions. Let's give some applause to Jakob. Jakob, hey! Thank you. Hey.